My um, involvement with the offshore uh, began uh, back in 1998 when I was employee for the f um, with the firm called Onlyway Development Group. We had come up with this with this idea uh, of um, of having an Aboriginal trade show, and so uh, at the trade show itself, uh, we had Sable Offshore uh, um, coming uh, to to both look at look to both look at our at our at our firms and to speak with the with the owners, and um, it was uh, it was from there. Uh, that uh, again, Sable Offshore was, at that same time, was looking to also uh, find a way to get uh, uh, native content into their project uh, with both uh, companies and with um, and and with and with staff. After the trade show ended, we had uh, Sable Offshore coming back and asking uh, whether or not I'd be interested to actually work um, to work to work to work with them and to uh, uh, carry forward. The work that that we began with Olden Wake and then and then to, to then take that forward, and to work with the with the offshore. Eric Christmas was hired, and I got a call about a week later uh, from Sable Offshore Management asking me to come in for some discussions about a potential contract to assist Eric. I'd met Eric Christmas when he was working with Olden Wake. I did security for them for the. Uh, show they had it in Halifax there, the trade show. I was in contact with Eric once he started working with uh, SOE. He mentioned to me that he was trying to get an Aboriginal alliance with companies formed. Uh, I told him I was very interested and we went from there. I got a call from Eric Christmas who was the Aboriginal liaison for Sable Offshore and they were trying to identify the capacity of uh, First Nation companies. I first heard of the Alliance through um, Eric uh, Christmas and uh, Robert Bernard uh, from their work with uh, Sable. They were uh, voting for a, uh, a an executive board, you'd call it. Um, so I was uh, nominated for one of the uh, members as an executive board member. What interested me the most when I first got involved was the opportunity to work with Zoe uh, in the, as far as being able to deal with the bigger companies. Most Aboriginal businesses are smaller and used to dealing with more things in a smaller volume. This gave them the opportunity to really have a look at what they could what they could do, what the big picture looked like, and to find out, again, a lot of the training aspects that they would need. There was two different focuses in terms of what our job was at Sable Offshore. One of them certainly was to have a list of qualified Aboriginal workers ready that could do work not only within the offshore oil and gas industry and the rigs, but also to try to have job ready individuals for the greater matrix of companies that uh, worked with Sable Offshore. But at the same time, we understood that there was a bigger need. There was a, a, a need in the communities that you know, existed within the businesses. We were trying to figure out what would be the best way to sort of expedite uh, Aboriginal companies coming into the, into, into the project. We realized really quick that we had to gather them together. We had to try to you know, increase their uh, strength in terms of numbers. So we decided that maybe we can uh, plan a meeting or plan a function that would gather these Aboriginal companies together and to uh, increase their resources to try to strength, uh, develop strength in numbers. And this was the time that the Aboriginal Alliance of Companies was born. Now this happened in early 1999. We had a meeting in Sydney. We brought together a lot of uh, businesses that we never really even knew existed. And we organized at that meeting. We divided up into separate sectors and we had an election of an executive. And uh, this became uh, known as the Aboriginal Alliance. And the Aboriginal Alliance was essentially between 40 and 45 companies that, were, that had uh, agreed to work uh, as, a, as a group. A lot of these businesses, they, they were basically looking for help in different ways. Help in terms of creating capacity within their own communities, creating capacity within their own businesses. One of the things that we looked at was who was going to take ownership, who was going to take the leadership role. There was a number of individuals that had more experience in, in the business setting and doing work you know, off reserve and, and really going after opportunities out there. You know, these leaders ended up being our first co-chairs, um, Daryl Bernard, Gary Aganaga, and then um, a couple of others, including myself, Tim Dunham, and uh, Eric Christmas at the time. And Eric took on the role of the industry liaison officer, which was very important because he was the link between 
Sable Offshore and other projects to the Alliance. What we learned from Eric and the contacts he had and what he was able to bring to the organization was that these are things that we needed to have in place in order to get contracts. These are the things that we had to think about in order to prepare our firms, in order to look at you know, what kind of training and investments that we had to make. What we were trying to do was to, to develop the companies that we had as members of the Alliance, to develop those companies so that they would be, that their capacity would be increased through uh, training programs in construction safety. It was very good for the companies that were involved. We organized and we worked together to help to reach a common goal. One of the things that we focused on was how are we going to promote our companies. One of the things we looked at was, okay, let's have a trade show. The trade show focused on actually a reverse type of trade show where we brought you know, organizations in, industry partners, we brought other companies in that they could potentially partner with. Our members could actually ask questions from these industry partners about different things. What are they about? What are their expectations? What are their uh, restrictions, liabilities? You know, we talked about bonding. We talked about the importance of investing. We were very happy with all of that stuff at the, at the very start. We were very excited. We kept on having these. We kept on moving them from different uh, locations. We invited different partners, different industry, and we started to include the government as well. There was no doubt in our mind that we were doing things that were never done before. We work with the unions and, and try to open up trade trades areas so that our Aboriginal people could, you know, increase their workforces. One of the things we spoke about earlier was the connections that we made with the trade unions but also the community colleges. We realized earlier that um, in the stages that when we started we wanted to make linkages for the Aboriginal people, for the Aboriginal communities and we realized really quick that the community colleges possess, possess the trades, possess the skill sets and the transferable skills that we need in our communities. We really thought about well, where are we going to get the funds? Where are we going to be able to partner to, in order for us to make those necessary moves to prepare our firms to do business with Sable Offshore? We really wanted to bring together, uh, I guess, partnerships. A lot of those partnerships came early in the stages between our own companies, between Alliance companies, and the investment came from Sable Offshore project itself. It's one of our core, core values at ExxonMobil that we try to uh, provide benefits to the communities where we operate. It makes a lot of sense from a business perspective, from a community relations perspective, from all perspectives. With the support of the companies, with the support of the Alliance executive, and with the support of Sable, and certainly that was the key things that kept us going. And certainly in the first couple of years of, of the organization, we were able to create a lot of opportunities, a lot of linkages. The direct benefit in terms of both contracts, uh, uh, the evaluation for the um, for the jobs, uh, investment by the by the firm into into different um, uh, into different um, like community ventures was about 2.5 million. In the earlier years in the formation of the Sable Offshore Energy Project, there was a number of negotiations that took place with the Sable Offshore. Um, the managers and the presidents, also with the province and the representatives there. Around the same time, there was a major court case that came down from the Supreme Court of Conduct called Delgamook. And that particular court case provided a new definition for Aboriginal title in Canada. This had really strengthened the Mi'kmaq claim to lands and resources uh, here in this part of the world. When we started a court case here in Nova Scotia, we were just on the verge of starting to talk about the Sable Offshore Gas Project. We decided to intervene uh, for the purpose of asserting our land title and our claim to uh, Aboriginal and treaty rights. So that was the whole purpose. It really wasn't about gas and oil. It was really about uh, title and land and resources. Because the Sable Offshore Project was in the midst of uh, the finalizing and developing their opportunities and really moving along, it created that opportunity for the Aboriginal leadership to sit down at the table to not only uh, discuss these opportunities with the Sable Offshore uh, Energy uh, Executives, but also the provincial representatives. We made application at the time to uh, get standing before the, um, the environmental uh, assessment panel, and we were granted standing. And so um, the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs uh, attended the hearings. The Assembly was dealing with um, issues with land and taxation and you know other things that they were trying to deal with at the time. So for us to 
be able to uh, develop an approach that was going to be sustainable and supported in a number of different ways. That was that was the kind of thing that was pretty tough at the start for us to to, um, to deal with and to be able to move forward. When the chiefs made a, made a stand to basically say before we before we can really agree to to um, to to any uh, to any offshore agreement, um, they wanted to have uh, um, a chance to to first discuss and to and to also negotiate. We wanted the company, uh, the two companies actually, SOE and uh, Maritimes Northeastern Pipe, East Northeast Pipelines, um, develop an economic benefits agreement for the Mi'kmaq people in Nova Scotia. And that became a condition in their permit. So uh, what that provided for us is an open door to begin sitting down both with uh, SOE and Maritimes Northeast Pipelines discuss an economic benefits agreement, and that's what took place uh, for the next uh, two or three years. With the alliance uh, and the executive, they 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 took the um, the uh, stand that rather than than them you know uh, pushing through and maybe getting contracts, uh, they they felt that maybe we should be a bit um, respectful of that of that process and that that leadership that they showed. To virtually um, refuse contracts in in the presence of, of these of these negotiations, I thought was uh, was 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 really amazing. In terms of generating long-term opportunities for the alliance and its companies, there was there was a lot of things that we planned in in trying to identify long-term. Um, projects such as the Maritime Northeast project, but also the Sempra Atlantic project. At the time, we even uh, visited Aboriginal companies in British Columbia with uh, the Alliance executive to see how they did their business, how they were able to compete in the industry down there, and to take the best of the knowledge that we had um, down here to partner with them to try to create more employment and, and contract opportunities. I believe it was in 2001 when Eric Christmas moved on to take a position at the Member 2 First Nation. It was then that I really had to make a conscious decision about staying with the organization at Sable Offshore. And I certainly did believe that I could still make an impact, a positive impact for our communities. And I ended up staying until probably in the early stages of 2003. Towards the later stages of 2003-2004, it seemed apparent that the Alliance wasn't getting the support that we were looking for, basically for a number of reasons. I think we were trying to make partnerships happen with industry, but also with government. And uh, with the development of the tripartite form, there was so much attention paid to that, and there was just so much work that needed to be done that we kind of fell by the wayside in terms of funding that we needed. During the offshore itself, when that, when that, when that, um, when that initial boom uh, was first happening, around that same time, the next thing that that occurred uh, was the Marshall decision, and suddenly. You had us. Uh, there was this. There was this amazing shift in focus, effort, and eventually investment by the by the First Nations, getting away from the offshore and that kind of and that kind of industry uh, into into the 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 fishing industry. Towards the end of 2003, my contract with Sable Offshore ended, and we didn't want to really start charging Aboriginal businesses to operate the alliance, even though that was an idea but funding mechanisms within government, within Aboriginal government, federal, provincial government, weren't really in place. We were doing things that basically the Department of Indian Affairs and the provincial government weren't ready for. And I could easily say that the Aboriginal government or Aboriginal communities weren't ready as well. They were dealing with issues that uh, dealt with social things that were going on in the community, economic development for communities specifically, but not, not Aboriginal business initiatives. Often we look back at it and we say First Nation government didn't support us as much as we had hoped, but also we didn't reach out to First Nation government and keep them informed on what we were doing and what we were trying to accomplish. What happened to the Aboriginal Alliance of Companies was the fact that we were successfully moving on in a direction that was positive for First Nation business, but we did not include First Nation government. The downturn in the industry also played a major role in terms of what was going to happen for Aboriginal people, Aboriginal communities. It was at a stage where the industry itself was um, not as busy. There was opportunities that they believe should have been happening, weren't taking place. 
And you know, it was around those the stages that not only the alliance but also Aboriginal involvement in the offshore industry certainly decreased. In order for us as a people to get some kind of benefit here, um, we have to sort of raise ourselves to a whole new standard. And I think that alone um, was, uh, I think, one of, the, one of the great legacies that the, that the offshore provided. Some of the greatest legacies have been the fact that some of the people that were involved in this have become successful. Like the rest of Nova Scotia, there was a lack of experience with, with an oil and gas project or an offshore natural gas project in this case. And, uh, they, you know, they, they, uh, the community rose to the occasion, participated, uh, uh, proved that uh, they're as good as anybody else in, get, in getting involved with this, with this organization, winning contracts, finding the work, and uh, being part of that positive benefit story that is the Sable Project. Getting people to realize what they had to do to get themselves ready. And that's really what happened uh, with Sable and uh, uh, the Aboriginal contractors. Uh, they, found, they found the niche, uh, upgraded the skill level, upgraded the safety and uh, quality assurance levels, and, and satisfied the requirements. They found out what they were, and then they delivered. I think there was this expectation that, you know, when the offshore came, the jobs would, would, would basically come, and they didn't. So it was that, that next two-year process of people and, and firms getting themselves prepared. And that, I think, will, will be the legacy. For at least two decades, uh, Mi'kmaq people were always told by federal and provincial governments that we had no rights in Nova Scotia, that our land um, was legally taken from us and that the, uh, our rights, be it Aboriginal or treaty rights, uh, were long ago extinguished. But when we began asserting our claims, uh, both the federal and provincial governments uh, began to get nervous. Perhaps the Mi'kmaq would go to court and stop this billion dollar project from happening. The two presidents also saw that liability and that risk. So they were very instrumental in talking both to federal and provincial governments and urging them to develop a negotiation table where title and rights can be discussed. And that particular table eventually became the Made in Nova Scotia process. Exploration is a program that encourages the participation of young women in grade 9, 10, 11, 12, I believe, in trades, technology, sciences. Exploration started in 1998. Uh, the program partners included the Nova Scotia Department of Education through their Apprenticeship and Skills Development Division, the Nova Scotia Community College, and WIT, Women in Trades and Technology. The founding sponsor was SOE Inc., which evolved into ExxonMobil, and they've been with us every step of the way, both financially financially as well as providing support. The tech exploration uh, uh, project has got a long, uh, like a long standing history now. Uh, it's going on to 10 years. What we talked about was putting together a division of eight schools. That's how we started with eight schools. This year we had over 30 schools involved in the program. Um, over 2,200 schools uh, or students participated in events this year and over 200 role models and volunteers from around the province. There isn't a program like Tech Exploration that I've ever seen that involves the entire community. Uh, for example, at the Wake Above First Nation Secondary School, it was one of the first of the eight schools involved in the program. Um, all of the students at the school, including the girls and the boys, all of the teachers, many of the parents, and a lot of the elders, they participate in the event every single year in different venues that we put on. Last year, the Wake Above First Nation School mentored the Wagmacook First Nation Secondary School, and it was great. So now that school is set up and ready to go. Askazoni started out about three years ago, but we also, besides the First Nation Community Schools, want to see um, involvement from the Aboriginal students at the public schools. The other thing that ExxonMobil did, and it was uh, through the guidance of Natalie Sterling Sanders, they not only provided funding for Nova Scotia and Newfoundland in the first year so that we could get the program developed and uh, get the program underway with a, a really solid foundation, 
but they also taught us how to fundraise. I think it's really important to start working with the kids when they're really young. When they're in grade nine, their minds are still really open. Um, they're, they're still really excited about their lives. One of the things that we tell every kid, and we do it over and over and over again, and that is that you can be anybody you want to be. You are important, um, and we want to see you grow. We want to see you become what you want to be. Uh, that, I think, is one of the biggest successes, uh, and I think that's going to have some long-lasting impact because it's uh, building long-term capacity in, uh, you know, generally in young women, but it's got a very strong component of uh, young women uh, from uh, Aboriginal backgrounds. That's a, a kind of a long-standing legacy as well. One of the things that we supported as a company when we first mo moved into Nova Scotia for the Sable Project was at the, what used to be the uh, University College of Cape Breton, which is now Cape Breton University, uh, provided some funding to uh, to the university uh, with with which they created the Aboriginal Studies programs. Way back in the uh, early 90s, mid 90s, we started uh, dreaming at the university in conjunction with some of the Mi'kmaq communities here in Cape Breton of new things that we might do at the post-secondary level to encourage more Mi'kmaq students to enter the sciences to, and to stay through the degree and graduate with science degrees. So towards that objective, we created a, a new science program called Integrative Science uh, that came into existence uh, in the fall of 1999. But one of the things that we lacked in terms of that new science program was any new financial resources. So when we became aware that Sable Offshore had potential to help us with funding, we were extremely enthused. This opportunity for the university, for Cape Breton University and its integrative science program to partner with Sable uh, was absolutely essential to move our, pro our new program forward because without that funding from Sable, many of the things that the program was desperate, uh, desperately in need of would not have happened 10 years ago. There were no Mi'kmaq students in our science programs. We've got now between 45 and 50 Mi'kmaq students in our science and science related programs here at CBU. What we're really trying to do here is encouraging Mi'kmaq students at the undergraduate science level and at the high school level to come experience science and develop projects that are of interest to them and of interest to the community. And you know, the the great thing is that those projects empower the young, young people and they contribute to the community, but they don't necessarily lead to the peer-reviewed publication that is the indicator that a, a typical research entity looks for when they're trying to demonstrate a, accountability for their money. The Sable funding was for two years, and I would be delighted if Sable were to consider another such program. The approach that we were using, combining the Western and the Indigenous sciences in the classroom, was unique. No one else had done it, and that's what was really possible with that Sable money. It enabled us to do that sort of thing. I think the uh, Secunda Cadet program uh, was a really successful uh, um, venture that uh, you know has long-lasting uh, as I understand it from Secunda long-lasting uh, benefits to them today in terms of uh, you know long-term employees that they found in, in Aboriginal uh, communities as a result of that initiative uh, and uh, you know I think that's a, an important legacy. Secunda has been in business since 1983 and of course we've worked with ExxonMobil uh, prior to really coming online with them in, in 1998 when they started the Sable Offshore Energy Project here in Nova Scotia. You know, if you look back on the, the history of Secunda, we've always had a cadet program. Where things got flanged up and where the partnership developed with ExxonMobil was based on, you know, the cadet program that was already in place here at Secunda. The first role is for industry to say, what do these people need to have in terms of training and experience so that we can hire them when they're done this program? We just kept focused on the participants and, and let's get some people uh, trained up, ready to go and, and ready to, to experience the offshore. I found out about it through a friend of mine, talked to Natalie on the phone. I just happened to be there when she was making the call looking for him and 
she had asked him on the phone if she knew if he knew anybody who wanted to go to Cuba working on a boat. The pitfalls of, of a young person joining a vessel, you know, just aren't related to Aboriginal people. I mean, that's there's people in general. I mean, it's it's a big lifestyle change and, and when you set sail on a vessel uh, it doesn't matter who you are you know there's some anxiety certainly uh, the cadets that we got involved with early on uh, were doing a three-week trip from from Halifax down to Cuba and then back. I was pretty excited to go actually I got kind of seasick at first but a few hours later I was running all around the boat it was, it was just a really good opportunity to get out and do something try to make something with your life. I think in terms of meeting expectations it was just you know really making them feel like they're part of the team uh, try to uh, try to fill them in on what was going to be required of them. Make sure that they felt safe. Uh, that the, you know all all aspects of their safety was 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 taken into account. And then really just get get them off on the right foot uh, in terms of you know being comfortable and, and confident and, and and having a good first experience so that uh, uh, when they were done that they uh, they could really give some strong consideration to continue to pursue the career. Basically, I think the day before we docked, the captain asked us. If there was anybody in our group that wanted to come back. Probably a week went by, Natalie called me. They were refitting two offshore boats to go working offshore and they, she asked if I wanted to do that and jumped all over it. The people in my mind that really stick out and that have made it and are long-term employees and good employees and, and valued employees here at Secunda are those that uh, you know just, just uh, rolled up the shirt sleeves and, and just went at it and showed an openness to learn new things, new skills. Took a lot of safety courses, St. John's, Wemyss. You do your uh, BST, you know, you do the swimming pool thing and they take you offshore there and do the uh, abandoned boat drills and teach you how to don the life suits and, you know, survival stuff, right? A lot of computer courses, a lot of safety stuff, really. Forklifts, did all the training through Caterpillar. Um, Basically, whatever training you need, they'll give it to you. That training is transferable. I mean, as long as it's recognized by Coast Guard, that's a major hurdle cleared going forward, I, I, I think, for sure. They just wouldn't give up, and they wouldn't relent, and this was, they were committed to Secunda, and we, in turn, ended up being very committed to them, and it just turned out to be a, a real mutually beneficial relationship. You know, Secunda, as a company, is very proud of, of, of the work that we've done with Aboriginal communities. Moreover, that uh, as a company, we've been rewarded for our work with the, the Aboriginal communities and that we have some long-term, hard-working, loyal, dedicated employees and, and actually the success of Secunda uh, can be attributed to uh, you know the hard work and dedication of these individuals. I would say I'm almost a totally different person than I was, for sure. I mean, principle-wise, for sure. You know, really, when I look at them, uh, it gives me a great, a great amount of pride. Uh, the world's their oyster. Uh, they continue to move up through the ranks. They made me what I am today, I guess. What I'd like to see is, is the Aboriginal business community in Nova Scotia, uh, or even in Cape Breton itself, um, uh, to work towards um, uh, almost like a, a, a Mi'kmaq Chamber of Commerce. There is a different perspective now coming from the Aboriginal communities where a number of them now are actually being involved in large projects and starting up businesses right at the community level. That's the stage where we're at is where we need to develop our own economies in our First Nations. The political leadership in our, in our communities has to recognize that business within our communities is the key to it self-determination. It's what we need. At the time I thought it was a great idea to have a business association for Aboriginals and I think it's uh, still a great idea to have an uh, organization uh, such as uh, the Alliance. The development of the Aboriginal Chamber of Commerce is certainly a, a prime focus, prime area right now where we can work together. The Aboriginal Alliance of Companies was one of the best things that I, I had ever contributed my time to. I hope someday that we're able to do something like that again. It's the next logical step. I personally would like to see um, uh, our First Nation governments uh, work uh, more closely hand in hand with our Aboriginal business community and to really develop a very solid voice. And it's just a matter of our businesses and our workforce uh, becoming united, developing a stronger voice and promoting that. There's other projects that are coming into play now and the Sydney Tar Ponds is actually an incredible opportunity for our people. The resources, the capacity and all of the work that was done with the Alliance and the companies and the communities involved, all these years are really going to start coming into play now. We're going to have much more opportunity for Aboriginal involvement, for companies, for individuals, 
for long-term commitment to uh, sustainable training initiatives in our community, and all because of things that happened way back with the Sable Offshore Energy Project. I feel very strongly that the experience that we have in business could play a very, very important part of the role of developing our economy in the future. What we're trying to accomplish is something that still needs to be accomplished. To me, the best case scenario would to be that when something gets announced, be it another offshore project or some major uh, you know, onshore project, that we're basically hitting the ground running. We're just simply ready to go.